it was a worthwhile experience just to hear all of these things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, so we'll bring them forward. So, <coughs> let's return to our discussion of the ethic of self-fashioning and nonconformity. And it's criticism and revision. So the point is not just to underline its weaknesses, but to see how we can reconstruct it so, so as to reshape it in a stronger form. As a result of this revision, it will indeed become closer to the other ethic and to the revised form of the other ethic, because we must also re reconstruct the other one. But I think that that doesn't mean that they'll come together, and we'll, and and we'll discuss that. In a sense, once they're revised and strengthened, their distinctions although diminished in some ways, may stand out all the more clearly in other ways. Now, remember the four lines of criticism which I suggested in class last week. The first class, the first criticism is that the canonical representations of this ethic, the ones that we have, for example, in its leading philosophers, like Emerson and Nietzsche, fail to give us an adequate account of what is implied in this coming to life of the individual. And they fail to give us an adequate account because they do not emphasize the contradictory character of the requirements of self-construction. And remember, I define these contradictions in three main dimensions. So one is the relation of the self to others. We need the others. We need to connect. We are nothing unless we connect, but every connect connection places us in jeopardy of subjugation and of the loss of personal distinction. And therefore, the question is how we can connect in such a way that the connection adds to us rather than subtracting from us. And that would be freedom. Uh, and so we, 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 we can say we have, an ex we have an experience of such a connection in personal love when it prospers, when it is successful, a connection that adds to us rather than circumscribing us. But personal love c does not flourish outside of intimacy. And the question is, therefore, what should the equivalent to it be among strangers. And one proposal is that the equivalent among strangers is some form of cooperation among free and equal individuals. But the institutional form of that cooperation will always be contested, and thus the conflicts of history. Now then, the second domain of these contradictions is the relation of the self to a particular social and cultural world. No one is free or in the possession of life if disengaged, if marginalized. We must engage in a world. But if the price of our engagement in a particular world is a surrender to it, then we also are not free. So our freedom in this domain would consist in being able to engage without surrendering, engaging in a way in which we continue to be vigilant and resistant and to exercise 
our power to challenge and change the framework within which we're acting. And we could say that too would be freedom. That would be freedom. And we can understand this ideal in both characterological and social or institutional terms. So it applies to, to us, to, to ourselves. Uh, we're going to bring that up in the third domain. Our character is a rigidified form of the self. And it applies to society, to the social context of our actions. How can we be insiders and outsiders at the same time? How can we give a secular meaning to Christ's command that we be in the world without being of it? The third domain is the relation of the self to itself. To be free, we must have a coherent way of being in the world coherent form of the self. We sometimes call it the character. But if the self takes us over, if it sucks the life away from us, then we also are not free. So we have to preserve in the relation to our habitual way of being, our character, a capacity for transcendence and disruption. And the ability to have a coherent way of being, but at the same time to resist it, to revise it, to disrupt it, is another dimension of freedom. Now, it seems to me that some such conception of what is implied in coming more fully into the possession of life becoming more human by becoming more godlike. Living in such a way that we can die only once uh, some such conception is necessary to a strengthened revised form of this ethic. And what it does is to re replace the simple idea of affirmation of the self with our attempts to grapple with a series of contradictory requirements in which, in which effort we can be more or less successful. Moreover, it draws attention to the relation and the difference between the moral and the political forms in which we do this, as I s gave in my example of the first contradiction. It has a moral dimension, we can, of which the most salient expression is personal love, and a political dimension. Now we come to the second criticism. Second criticism is the criticism of Prometheanism. The tendency in the canonical formulation of this ethic to suppose that the individual can save himself, he can lift himself up, he can be, as I said last week, the little Napoleon who crowns himself. And thus life becomes a triumphal march. But life is not a triumphal march. And the, the, the first defect of this idea is its radical and misleading denial of our finitude, of our frailty, of our vulnerability. So we can say it's a lie. It's a lie that we tell to ourselves. In the presence of death, we beat the drums of this triumphal march. At what cost of self-delusion, of self-deception? And moreover, by proceeding in this way, we deprive ourselves of the most potent instrument for our arousal. 
from the slumber of routine, of compromise, of conformity, the very concern of this ethic. So it seems paradoxical in these canonical formulations that an ethic so concerned with the evil of imitation or conformity should then deprive itself of the most powerful inducement to our awakening. And what is this inducement? The inducement is precisely the confrontation with the reality of our situation, with mortality, with our groundlessness, with the insatiable character of human desire. The third defect that I underline is the lack of a political horizon, or at least an acceptable political horizon, in the canonical formulations of this ethic. So in the philosopher, by default, it seems the implication is that it is really an elite of self-constructors, of heroes, of geniuses, of saints, who stand above the herd of conformist humanity. Uh, failing to recognize that if we are to ascend to a higher form of life, we can ascend only together. What is the most terrible question with which a human being can be presented? The question is, where are the others? And in this, in this canonical formulation of the ethic of self-fashion and nonconformity, that question remains unasked. Now then we have the other voice of this ethic, liberal political theory, which presents us the idea of a formula for freedom, an impersonal order of right, neutral, among conflicting conceptions of the good. And I argued last week that this too is an illusion, that no order of right, no set of principles can be neutral among conflicting visions of the good and forms of human experience. Every, uh, every idea tilts every conception of right, every institutional order tilts the scales, favoring some forms of human experience and disfavoring others. Nevertheless, the false idea of neutrality that has the effect of, in a sense, reversing itself, that is, it entrenches a, an, an order calls it neutral, and therefore immunize it against attack and criticism. This false idea has a kinship to an idea that is legitimate and even indispensable. No institutional order can be neutral, but an institutional order can and should be open to a wide range of contradictory experience, and above all, should be susceptible to correction in the light of experience. Contradiction and corrigibility are the legitimate counterparts to the illegitimate ideal of neutrality. Uh, and then there's the romantic voice and its politics, which affirms that we are only fully ourselves in those brief interludes in which we shake the whole of structure of routine, of repetition, and return human life to its temporary fluid state. We liquefy the structures temporarily. We know when we liquefy them that the structures will return that their return is inevitable. They are the hand of Midas killing the spirit. The spirit affirms itself against structure. And this idea, I argued, 
reflects a despair, an unrealistic despair about our incapacity to, 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 to alter the relation between spirit and structure, to create structures that are more hospitable to spirit. What is spirit? Spirit is transcendence over structure. But we can create structures that are organized in such a way that they open themselves more fully to challenge and change. And that would be a change in the relation between spirit and structure, so that we could be in them without surrendering to them. Now, so there's no political horizon in the, in, in the versions of this ethic that we have. What would be the political horizon? that we are missing in the inherited versions of this ethic. Now let me state a version of this political horizon. And let me call it the politics of deep freedom. So our conventional view of the ideological conflict is that it is a conflict between shallow freedom and shallow equality. The left are those who accord priority to equality against the background of the established institutional arrangements. And the right are those who accord priority to freedom against the background of the same arrangements. So what shallowness means in this vocabulary is the failure to address and change the background structure, the institutional structure especially of the economy and of the state, of democracy. So, for example, uh, if you take now the predominant theories of distributive or corrective justice in the Anglo-American Academy today, like the Rawlsian theory of justice, they are expressions of shallow equality. So there's an egalitarian commitment, of, a commitment of egalitarian faith, a profession of egalitarian faith, but it's combined with institutional skepticism or conservatism. If you sum up those two things, the egalitarian commitment and the institutional skepticism or conservatism, what is the sum of that addition? The sum is the bet that you place on equality reduced, trivialized as simply the attenuation of the inequalities generated in the present market order through some form of corrective redistribution by progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements. And the principles enunciated in this philosophy are designed to guide this redistributive or corrective exercise. So it is a kind of pseudo-philosophical prop to the homely practices of compensatory corrective redistribution under institutionally conservative social democracy. Now, so what's the alternative to this conflict between shallow freedom and shallow equality? Is it deep equality? That is, we lift the constraint and we say an equality of outcome or circumstance is the aim. And we achieve it then by simply canceling out all the significant inequalities generated in the market. No, no one has ever wanted that. So the real aim would not be deep equality, it would be deep freedom. Our ascent together to a higher form of life. And entrenched inequality should not be tolerated because it is a corruption, a perversion of our relations to one another, of our capacity to ascend together. But the main aim is not equality. The main aim is our empowerment. 
of our freedom, of our freedom together to ascend to a higher form of life. And what are the institutional expressions of this freedom? So in the economy, for example, uh, it would be, uh, let me describe it remotely, far off. Uh, the access of the largest part of humanity, of the labor force, to the most advanced practice of production. Today, it's what we call the knowledge economy, penetrated by the imagination, by constant innovation, by experimentalism. Uh, the evolution of technology in a, in a direction that enhances labor rather than replacing it because we shouldn't think of technology as an autonomous force with a logic of its own. We determine its logic. And what we would want at the end of the day is a world in which no human being is condemned to do what a machine could do. The machine does what we've learned how to repeat so that we can do the not yet repeatable. We're the anti-machine working with the machine. And the higher forms of free work, self-employment and cooperation, as the liberals conceived them in the 19th century, would come to prevail over the deficient, the defective forms of free work, the defective form, economically dependent wage labor. Uh, they could never prevail over economically dependent wage labor unless we managed to reconcile these higher forms of free work, self-employment and cooperation, with the relentless imperative of economies of scale. And that, in turn, requires innovation in the regime of property. So, for example, the, the major resources of society are placed in a series of public funds or trusts, and there is a rotating capital auction. So whoever is able to assure the funds of the highest rate of return gets to use these productive resources temporarily. Now, I'm just describing a series of very of, of ideas very remote from present reality to give you a sense of the direction. This is the direction. Marx and Keynes believed that we're on the verge of overcoming scarcity, and that when we do overcome scarcity, we will be free from the hateful burden of work and be able to devote ourselves to our sublime private avocations. But the truth is, and they also, so they believe both that we're about to overcome scarcity and the hate and that work, practical work in the economy is, can never be anything more than a hateful burden. Both of these views are false. We're not about to overcome scarcity. Scarcity is endlessly reproduced in new forms. But work does not need to be a hateful burden. And so we can formulate an idea of freedom in the economy and not just freedom from the economy, contrary to Marx and to Keynes. So that's, let's say, the economic project. And what is the political project? The political project is the deepening of democracy, the creation of a form of democratic politics that does not need crisis to make change possible, and that therefore overthrows the rule of the living by the dead. And what is such a high energy democracy like? It, elevates the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular engagement in political life. It accelerates the tempo of politics, 
by resolving impasse quickly, uh, reaffirming the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, but repudiating the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics, as in the Madisonian scheme of checks and balances. And it combines a facility for decisive action by the central government with radical devolution, as in a federal system. So as society goes down a certain road, it hedges its bets, allowing parts of itself to deviate and to generate counter models of the national future. And thus, instead of having a dogmatic commitment to some institutional blueprint, we create a dialectic of experiments. That's the political direction. So I'm giving you examples, economic and political, of what I mean by a politics of deep freedom. It is such a politics that is missing from the canonical form of the ethic of self-fashioning and of nonconformity. It has no political horizon, and I'm claiming this is its political horizon once we correct it. Now, the fourth criticism is the criticism, remember, of the emptiness of the ideal of autonomy. At the center of this ethic is this notion that we become free to do, to do things. But to do what? The ideal of autonomy seems to be hollow, empty. Where does its content come from? Its content, I argued, comes from our connections with one another, our attachments, and from our engagements, our tasks. That's where its content comes from. And uh, what animates us in these connections and engagements are our discoveries of the transformative possibilities of experience, which I call epiphanies. And these epiphanies, in turn, inform our anticipations of a greater life, our prophecies. That's where the content comes from. But once we reformulate the otherwise empty idea of autonomy in this way, we see that it has a price. The price is vulnerability. The price is that we can make mistakes. The price is that our connections can fail. Our love can be rebuffed. In choosing our tasks, we can make mistakes. We have to pick sides, and we can pick the wrong side. And so that's, that's, that's the reality that brings this ethic closer to the actual texture of human experience and away from this otherwise empty ideal of autonomy. So that's a, a very summary description of the general direction in which we would revise the canonical ethic of self-construction, making it more realistic and strengthening its claims on us. And let me stop there and ask you, you Michael, whether you want to comment. Absolutely. So let me just take a few moments to underline what Professor Unger is doing here. So we have seen in the ways that this ethic of self-transformation has developed in the 19th, 20th, and now 21st centuries, we've looked at two basic approaches. The first approach is what we can generally call standard liberal political ide ideology. Uh, not liberal in the sense of liberalism, but the standard liberal ideology that would define all of us as self-sovereign individuals who choose through our freedom to engage in whatever form of decision-making we choose. Um, we saw the philosophical versions of this, of course, in our very first session, where the question is you have self-sovereign individuals freely deciding do they follow a Kantian ethic or a consensual ethic or a consequentialist ethic to decide what they want to do. And we noted, and here let me underline the implications of, the fact that 
in making these arguments, they always operate by means of these abstracted situations which cut out everything that you would think would matter. The standard example we gave, you're in a life raft, there are four of you, there's food for three people, how do you decide what to do? Meaning that you're on a life raft, you're not in this world, you are all, by definition, for rational individuals in the example. You all can choose amongst yourselves what decision to make. There's a pre-given problem. There's food for exactly three of you, and there are exactly four of you. And how do you answer this? Meaning, in practice, you cut out everything that actually is, in, is part and parcel of what it means to be embedded in a social, political, and economic world. This is a perfect example of the way standard liberal political theory operates, and it isn't just at the theoretical level. It's a perfect example of how a liberal ideology works in general. It does precisely as Professor Unger said, it cuts out everything. It means, to, turning to the obvious example, in the US we will say every US citizen is a sovereign individual, they can vote, and by voting, they can make decisions about how to live properly. In practice, of course, you actually have incredibly little power to affect much of anything in terms of the entire economic, social, and political world. Inequality is not only existent, it is built into the workings of the system. None of that is actually anything you can work on, except, as Professor Unger mentioned, in minor ways, so you can decide if the highest tax rate should be 36% or 32%, and accordingly, the welfare should be a little bit higher or a little bit lower. Um, needless to say, if it's 36% versus 32%, that's a pretty minimal <laughs> debate in terms of rethinking economic inequality, and one can continue those examples endlessly. So yes, you ideally get a vote, even that is not always a given. Even if you do, what you physically can vote on is absurdly limited. It is the perfect example of you being on that life raft. In other words, that example perfectly exemplifies the way in practice liberalism operates. So if that is one version of the ethic of self-transformation, a radical domestication that basically means Self-transformation is restricted to you being a self-sovereign individual with these incredible restrictions as to what that would mean. We've noted the other version of this, which is the romantic impulse, to say all of that would be the, an example of a herd mentality, and the true individual is one that would break out of all of that through radical acts of revolution. Meaning, as we have seen, you would, be free for that brief moment when you are being radically transformative and then you would return to mundane reality. Or it could mean a, a dramatic political transformation, but as we've noted, in extraordinary dangerous ways where essentially that one radical individual will be given total power um, <laughs> with the obvious dangers that that would play out, both theoretically and as we have seen historically. So if those are two of the ways this is played out, an attempt to develop an ethic of self-transformation, a secularization and naturalization of Christian claims that worked out in terms of the world that we live within. What Professor Unger is doing here is to say, let us reconstruct it, and let us reconstruct it in some specific ways. To begin with, you don't simply begin by claiming we humans become gods in some minimal sense, in liberal political theory, a really minimal sense, <laughs> that, that we have an incredibly limited body of, of control, namely over our property that we will give up to greater or lesser degrees depending on you know, 36 versus 32 percent, or you know, for us I've seen a <laughs> lower tax bracket um, at, at various levels. So you have an incredibly low level vision of what that sovereign divinity is in human form. Or, in the romantic version, of course, you get a radicalization of it, but with all of the limitations we have seen. So Professor Unger's move here is to say, yes, we do become more human, more human precisely by becoming godlike, but he will, he will say that only works in terms of the fundamental contradictions that we have to think of this divination through. In those fundamental contradictions, therefore, if this is the way that the divinization operates, 
What this means is the act of freedom is inherently involved in precisely the work of radically engaging with the world, engaging with others, engaging with the world within which others exist, and through that engagement is where freedom occurs, which also means, by definition, the standard form of liberal politi political ideology that cuts out the really fundamental questions of how to rethink the world and how to live in the world, cutting out, in other words, deep freedom, as Professor Unger calls it, that, on the contrary, becomes precisely the goal. So you explicitly try to create a political order of deep freedom, where it is precisely through the active engagement of transforming the world that self-transformation can occur, and putting it the other way, self-transformation cannot occur without an active, constant transformation of the world. It can either be domesticated in a liberal sense, nor simply defined in a radical romantic sense that is always, by definition, going to be incredibly limited in terms of time span or implications, or taken to incredibly dangerous forms of political authority. Therefore, the reconstruction entails working within that fundamental contradiction, and then, excitingly, he takes it the next step and says, how then would we rethink the economic order when it's not simply a debate of 36% versus 32% as tax rates? How would it mean to, what would it mean to have the kind of radical democracy we are talking about where active abilities to change the world is built into the system, not, as Professor Unger says, just in those, those crisis moments when there's a you know, stock market disaster where suddenly a, a few <laughs> things can change and you can push up the tax rates to 37% for, for a year, but rather it is built into the workings of the system, economically, politically, socially. How would we do this? And part of the excitement, of course, and this is, this is part of what what makes, I think, this reconstruction so powerful is Professor Unger makes his arguments in terms of examples of what it would mean in practice, meaning by definition there's not a blueprint for this. It will mean radically different things in any context, but the goal then is we then devote our lives to, to that level of engagement, trying to make this possible in whatever ways it will mean in practice, hence avoiding the domestication of standard liberal political theory and the either apolitical or dangerous political implications of the purely romantic version of this. So, with that as a quick underlining of what Professor Unger is doing, let me hand now, it back. Now, I think that the, the, the important then to come back to this idea that after we criticize and attempt to begin revising this ethic, it nevertheless retains its distinct profile. It doesn't begin to merge into the other ethic that we'll begin reconsider. And at the very end of class last week, I gave a list of features that it retains as distinct, even after it's been revised in this direction that I just suggested. So, of course, the point of departure is the individual. The point of departure is not the interpersonal, the logic of the interpersonal. Second. The conception of the individual is a conception that still emphasizes transcendence, that there is more in each individual as well as in the hu whole human race than there is or ever can be in the social and conceptual worlds that we build and inhabit. That's the conception of transcendence, and that remains in a revised form of this ethic revised along the lines that I just discussed. The third is that this ethic has an internal relation to this revolutionary project that's in the world. I, I, I argued last week, this project, which with its political side and its personalist side, that has put the world on fire for two or three centuries now, is inseparable from this ethic. The history of this ethic is part of the history of that project. There, the, you, you, can't, you can't separate them. And it has an intimate relation, to the, especially to the personalist side of this, of this ethic. And one way, again, of understanding here how, from my standpoint, we, 
what from my standpoint the agenda of this course is, is that this revolutionary program is now simultaneously strong and weak. It's strong because it remains in command of the agenda of humanity, although it has many enemies, but it's weak because its defenders no longer know what its next step should be. So one way to think about this agenda, the agenda of this course, is that it's about the next steps of this revolutionary project on the personalist or moral rather than the social or political side. Uh, and, and this occurs at a moment in which one might say, we are living in a counter-revolutionary interlude during a long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. I am determined that my ideas and actions will not be shaped by the biases of this counter-revolutionary interlude. And that's why I'm doing this kind of thing. Now, the fourth way in which this ethic retains its distinctive character uh, can be stated in the plane of moral psychology, I said, it has an idea that dis the disruptors, the inventors, the troublemakers are the spiritual aristocracy of the human race. They're the vanguard. And that idea is, I think, deeply implanted in all versions of this ethic, including a version revised along the lines that I just discussed. Now, so then we have this problem. We're, 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 we're going to be dealing with another contemporary ethic also now, the ethic of connection and responsibility. And the first impulse is to imagine that they can be synthesized in some way. There's some truth here. There's some truth there. We can bring them together. I think there's reason to resist this idea of an easy synthesis. As I said, once we have reconstructed both of them, they come closer together in some ways. But in other ways, the differences between them become all the clearer. They don't become the same. And in order to begin to establish the background for this idea of the limits of synthesis and the extent to which these two ethics represent now an enduring duality in the moral consciousness of humanity. I want to discuss the relations between them from a different standpoint. So let's begin by returning to the idea that each of, each of these, two th these two ethics has a privileged relationship to one of the two great powers in the world, the United States and China, the ethic of self-fashioning and nonconformity to the United States, and the ethic of connection and responsibility to China. But this association of the two ethics with the two great powers is contingent and subject, I suggest, to radical reversal. Each of these two ethics is deeply appealing to the other country. So there are many strands in American culture of dissatisfaction, of discontent with the consequences of an individualistic and materialistic acquisitiveness and a desire to escape to a world of greater solidarity. And the opposite is true with respect to China. So let me give you a very simple example of the 
the way in which and the reasons for which the opposite ethic could be appealing to them. Now, you know that one of the policies that has been in force in China is the single child policy. So at least until very recently, every family had to have just one child. And this child was obsessively doted on by its parents and grandparents. So the consequence, a characteristic predictable consequence, is the formation of what you could call self-obsessed narcissistic personality. In a culture in which the individual is destined to confront massive repression, social, cultural, political repression, this is an explosive combination, the combination of the self-obsessed personality, the spoiled child with the repressive collective order. And it's easy to understand why then the opposite ethic would be so appealing, not in its revised reconstructed form, the form that I've been trying to give it here, but in its crude form, uh, in, in the form of the unreconstructed individualism. That's the form in which it's attractive, given this background. So, uh, so I'm a lawyer. I know, as a lawyer, how easy it is to make things that are different look alike. So uh, <laughs> that's. It's very easy. It's, 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 it's a rhetorical manipulation. So it's very easy to do that. So if, if we set out to produce a, quote, synthesis of these two visions in a rhetorical form, it would be easy to do that. But, the, but this is a trivialization of what's involved in, in the exercise. This is not about words not like some kind of shell game, uh, because these ethics point human life in different directions, morally and politically. And a further reason to think that way is then to consider that they are related not just to two particular societies or cultures. They have this privileged association but to the objective functional imperatives of the advanced society, as, as I said before. So behind the ethic of self-fashioning and nonconformity stands the imperative of the formation of the enhancement of personal agency. The advanced societies require an individual who is able to stand up, to innovate, to face the context, to, to tinker with it, uh, and not a passive, routinized functionary of some collective order. And behind the ethic of connection and responsibility stands the functional imperative that I'm going to be labeled, that I'm going to label the higher forms of cooperation. I'll say more about that later. So the imperative of the form of the enhancement of agency is manifest, one of the ways in which it's manifest is in the ability to innovate. And what are these higher forms of cooperation? How should we think of them? So one way of thinking of them is that they are those forms that are shaped by the contradictory requirements that I described before of the relation of self to others, of self to culture or society, and of self to self. So we could say, you could think of them also. Another way to think about them is they satisfy a series of requirements. So uh, 
The first requirement is that the form of cooperation is not fastened down to a single dogmatic version of itself. For example, the market order. What is the market? The market is a form of simplified cooperation among strangers that is unnecessary when there is high trust and impossible when there is no trust. It depends on a modicum of trust generalized among strangers. But the market has no single natural and necessary form. There can be a contest over the institutional form of the market order, just as there is a contest over the institutional form of democratic politics. One of the characteristics of what I'm calling the higher forms of cooperation is that they don't associate cooperation with a single dogmatic institutional vehicle. They allow for experimentation with the forms of cooperation. A second characteristic of these higher forms of cooperation is that they secure the individual in a haven of vital safeguards against private and public oppression and of capability ensuring endowments, social endowments, educational endowments. But all are, but so they have this haven, which is the concern of historical social democracy, to secure the individual in a haven. But around the haven, they organize a storm, a storm of innovation. Why do we give the individual this haven? We give the individual a haven so that he can stand up and thrive and act in the midst of change all around him, the storm. The storm doesn't occur spontaneously. The storm has to be arranged. That's innovation in the forms of the economic order and of politics. So a, a, a political ideal that focuses just on the haven, which is historical social democracy, is very different from a politics that sees the haven as the counterpart to the storm. Now then, another way of stating these higher forms of cooperation is that in them, we think the individual is not condemned to, to work and to live as if he were a machine. Everything that we've learned how to repeat, we express in a formula or an algorithm, and then the formula or the algorithm we embody in a physical contraption, the machine. The machine does for us what we have learned how to repeat so that we can preserve our supreme and in a sense our only resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. And therefore, what we want is this powerful combination of the machine with the anti-machine What's the anti-machine, the human being, with the faculty of imagination? The combination of the machine and the anti-machine is much more powerful than either of them alone. And the higher forms of cooperation are the forms in which the human beings can use the machines in this way. To run ahead of the machines, what are the machines? The machines are us yesterday and we go before them. And then what is the form of free work? The form of free work is self-employment and cooperation, not economically dependent wage labor, but that requires us then to innovate in the regime of property so that the access to the what Karl Marx called the means of production does not depend on some perpetual claim of a, of a small part of society to those means. 
but the access to the means of production is democratized. For example, through an incessant capital auction, an auction of the productive resources of society to those who can use them most effectively. Now, that's a description of what I'm calling the higher forms of cooperation. There is a tension between these two functional imperatives, the imperative of the formation of agency and the higher forms of cooperation. The enhancement of agency is manifest in innovation. Every innovation threatens the established regime of cooperation. Because every time there's an innovation, a conceptual innovation, a technological innovation, a, an organizational innovation, it, it disturbs the established regime of cooperation. The question is, who's going to win by it? Who's going to lose by it? There's a conflict over its consequences, over the distribution of the gains and of the losses. So we could say, what is the best cooperative regime? The best cooperative regime is the one that is most hospitable to innovation. And that's how we would attempt to diminish the tension between the enhancement of agency and the higher forms of cooperation. But we can't ever abolish this tension. So behind the difficulty of synthesizing these two epics stands, I want to argue, the residual tension between these two functional imperatives, the enhancement of personal agency manifest in innovation and the disposition to cooperate. So this is not a conversation about words. It's not uh, how, to how to produce a synthetic rhetoric that could please us. These moral ideas acquire seriousness to the extent that they are manifest in forms of social organization and in directions of personal life. And once they become material in that way, we can see that they can't be easily combined. Uh, and that they have fateful consequences. And let me underline that point very strongly. <laughs> so. It is very typical um, in a lot of Western political theory in particular to set up debates where, of course, the goal is the synthesis. So to give a Hegelian dialectic is the most obvious example. Hegel will give you this position. He'll give you the counter position. And then the work is to say, how do we synthesize these in a way that, that builds on the best sides of each? And then once we get that synthesis, you're looking for what are the contradictions, which again, you synthesize again. That's an extreme version, but it's very typical of the way a lot of Western political theory operates. And what we are doing in this class is going to be very much the opposite. So we are now involved in the reconstruction of the self-transformation ethic. We will, beginning in two weeks after our spring break, turn to the, the early versions of the visions of cooperation that were developed by Confucius. We will then turn to its reconstruction. And our goal, as Professor Unger has mentioned, is far from trying to synthesize these, it will be to try to take each as seriously as we can precisely by allowing each to challenge the other at the most fundamental level because the true differences are going to lie there. We are seeing the self-transformation and all of the difficulties of building out an ethics, but always, even in that reconstructed form, it's focused on the individual. We will see with the beginnings in Confucianism, the example we'll be turning to in two weeks, and in its reconstructed form. On the contrary, the goal is going to be inherently how you build out an ethics of relationships
precisely as relationships, where it's all about refining those relationships into modes of cooperation. The focus is not the radical individual conceived either in a liberal sense or romantic sense or in this reconstructed sense. And then in the debate between the two, our goal will be to allow each to challenge the other, meaning what are the inherent dangers of an approach based on self-transformation, even in its most philosophically best <laughs> reconstructed form, and conversely, going the other way too, and the goal of that is not a synthesis, it's to allow an even further, more sophisticated reconstruction, the idea being that you're endlessly trying to develop the full implications of either precisely through that debate and precisely through allowing that challenge to occur. And let me also underline the point that we will, we've already seen with America and we will certainly soon be seeing with China, in the current versions of these two ethics, the United States of America and China respectively, um, we are seeing um, hardly these reconstructed versions, to put it mildly. And the debates, therefore, that are going on in them and within them and between them are not of the reconstructed versions, to put it mildly again. <laughs> so with the US, as we have seen, it's you're primarily dealing with standard liberal political the ideology, which limits the, the full development of the self-transformation ethics. In China, we'll look at this in much more detail in two weeks, but certainly we will see Xi Jinping hardly represents the full complexities of, of working out an, an ethics of cooperation. And moreover, the degrees to which you have the battles between the two and within are pr therefore precisely on these non-reconstructed versions. So Professor Unger mentioned, and here let me just say a few more words about what is going on in China right now, absolutely true. Um, <laughs> so if you go to China, you will be immediately confronted with what will strike you as an incredibly individualistic society when you're looking at the youth culture, incredibly. Um, one of the reasons, as Professor Unger has mentioned, was the one-child policy, creating what's known in China as the little emperor syndrome. So families will invest everything into one child who becomes that little emperor. Another key element and directly interrelated is that beginning in the 90s, China became arguably the most laissez-faire capitalistic system in the entire world, much more so than America, far more, despite all the rhetoric. And so you get this incredibly laissez-faire capitalistic system in the 1990s, built, then building into that, this very, very strong individualistic push in, involving, as we've mentioned, various um, social factors. That is precisely what then played out into the creation of radical social inequalities in China, which is part and parcel of what Xi Jinping is now trying to, to gain his power to say, I am going to stand up to this because all of this was an Americanization of, of China and I'm going to stand up to radical social inequality, radical individualism, try to rebuild um, a society of, of cooperation. But note, all of that is against a one particular, to put it mildly, type of the vision of self-transformation, namely the, the kind of 1990s neoliberal version of individualism, and that attempt to control it, as we will see in much more detail, is hardly going to be what I suspect most of us would see as the most powerful version of the cooperative model. I would make the exact same point jumping back to the US. So in the US, Yes, you have had precisely what I was just mentioning was going on in China in the 1990s. That, of course, was coming from America. So in America, you had the development of a strong individualistic neoliberal ideology that became in the 1990s what was called the Washington Consensus, an absolute consensus about a radical form of neoliberal economic order based in a dramatic reduction of state activity in the economy, meaning a reduction of the welfare state, a reduction of taxations, etc. And as a Washington consensus, this becomes the model for the world with the US at its basis. And there actively is in China, a, I mean, I'm sorry, in America, a very telling Freudian slip, a pushback against this in all of the forms. However, that pushback is not always in what could be, from our perspective, the most powerful version. So even the degree to which this debate is currently playing out between the US and China, and within each, <laughs> the US and China, within itself, 
is not playing out in what we would call the most powerful ver versions. So our goal here will be to try to do that in the few weeks to come, to try to develop these reconstructed versions. We're doing it in self-transformation. We will be doing it in terms of the ethics of cooperation in the two weeks after spring break. And then thereafter, although along the way too, trying to allow each to challenge the, mo the, e the other in the most philosophically sophisticated way we can and hopefully therefore propel the tremendous revolutionary power of each precisely in that strong engagement. Shall we open up? Let us open up. So as always, everything is up for grabs. Please, yes. So there are so many places where one could begin that conversation, I think. But one way to begin it is, I, is the, w the way I suggested in an, in, in, in an earlier class when I was discussing the American prophecy and the message of the American prophet. Remember uh, Emerson, Whitman, Lincoln, Melville, and so forth. So. What is the message of the American prophets? The message is the individual participates in the divine life and becomes more human by becoming more godlike, sharing in the divine attribute of transcendence, not in the divine attributes of omniscience and omnipotence. And I said then, uh, from the very outset, this prophetic message was tainted in two ways. So it was tainted first because it had an inadequate view of the relation between self-construction and solidarity. It separates them. So self-construction comes first. And then solidarity is the afterthought, the magnanimity, the generosity that is given on the basis of strength so that the little Napoleon, who first crowns himself and then engages with his fellows. That's a misrepresentation of the relation between self-construction and solidarity. Solidarity is internal to self-construction. And that has a host of moral and political consequences. Then the second taint is the taint of institutional idolatry. So the country is experimental about everything, but not about its institutions. And there's a whole line of American thinkers, from Thomas Jefferson to John Dewey, who try to convince their fellow citizens to lift the exemption which they accorded to their institutions from the reach of the experimentalist impulse. And these thinkers on the whole failed in this, uh, in this attempt at persuasion. So uh, the institutions are, are, are the object of a, of a cult, the cult of the Constitution, uh, the reification of the market order, and so forth. And the argument would be the country desperately needs experimentation and rethinking with its institutional arrangements. Uh, no, institutional no institutional arrangements are sacrosanct. They're all dust in the eyes of God, and uh, they, ha they, they have to be the object of this experimentalist impulse. So that's one way in which you would begin the conversation. You would say, the, ethic, the, the American spirit has to be reformed from within, 
through the correction of this prophetic message. Yes, and very much building upon that. Um, so one of the standard parts of modernity theory that developed in the 19th century that we still very much live within is that secularization is an inherent part of the modernization process. So religion is associated with so-called traditional societies, and as societies modernize, they inherently become modern. This, according to standard 19th century theory, the argument was, well, it's happening in the West first because the West was seen as the vanguard of modernization, and eventually that will be true throughout the entire world. Um, many of the theories of modernity should be questioned pretty dramatically, but few have been so ludicrously empirically wrong <laughs> as that one. Um, the only part of the entire globe in which that theory has any purchase whatsoever is turning out to be pretty exclusively Western Europe. I mean, the Western Europe that's kind of in part true, um, but that is a complete exception to the entire world. Um, through most of the world, actually, religions are not only growing dramatically, but are actively being reformulated in incredibly exciting ways, and also for the very fact that we just mentioned, the nature of modernity theory, in ways that are oftentimes just not even being paid attention to by political theorists, which is a long preface to get back to your question. Um, yes, I think it is entirely possible that much of the radical reconstruction of these ideas, the regaining of the prophetic voice, will cut across our easy divisions of what is secular and what is religious. Um, a lot of what we call now religious is, is actively being rethought. A lot of what we call secular, by definition, is actively being rethought. And eventually, that very distinction may lose a lot of its meanings. So, um, so are prophetic so voices secular or religious? Well, they're kind of so both, and therefore neither. So Michael, just a footnote to that that relates to the discussion of the United States. So, one, in general, one of the characteristics of a religion is that it refuses to be cabined in any particular domain of human life. And the faith wants to be manifest in, in every dimension of existence, moral, political, whatever. However, there is, there is an exception to that which is especially relevant to the understanding of American history. And that is the privatization of religion that occurred especially in the middle period of the history of Protestantism, and which is incredibly significant for the United States. In the late 18th century and the 19th century, religion conceived as a matter of the private internal consciousness and privatized. So uh, this wasn't true of early Protestantism, the Protestantism of Luther and Calvin. And it's not true of contemporary Protestantism with its social teaching. But it was true in, to a large extent in this moment in the evolution of Protestantism. And that moment seems to have had tremendous consequences for the formation of the public doctrines of the United States. So that, in, in, in a sense, the potential of Christianity to animate the transformation of society was limited in this moment of privatization. And now we can generalize that idea in, because one of the characteristics of these cultures, these contemporary societies, is what you could call the privatization of the sublime. So everything that is most adventurous or profound, uh, uh, art, religion, uh, personal experience is reduced to the private conscious politics on this view. It's supposedly about the cold realm of marginal gains in equity and efficiency. The sublime is locked in the individual conscience. And of course, this whole discussion that we're having in the course is against that. Uh, the sublime has to be pursued everywhere. And it, it's like the idea of religion. 
So I think that's in the background here in some, in some powerful way. Yes. Well, what do you mean by universal? Do you mean worldwide? So I think so, but this touches on this question of the nation, right, uh, which we briefly discussed at some moment in the course. Uh, so humanity develops its powers only by developing them in different directions. There is not an incontestable form of social life. There's not a natural way. And the nations of the world used to be tribes. Uh, drawn together by ethnic and cultural similarity and by tangible customs. So that's so for the ancient Romans to be a Roman meant to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans. So that's what the nations were. They were a, a, a people, a family of families established on the basis of some quasi-biological consanguinity, but also similarity of customs. Now the nations of the world are in the process of becoming something else. They are experiments in different ways of being human, right? And along the way, in this transformation from tribes to experiments in ways of being human, an accident has occurred. Uh, there's a worldwide emulation. And in order to prosper in that ideological, economic, and military competition, the nations of the world have to raid one another to see what works. They have to tear out parts of their customs, of their inherited collective identity, and combine what remains with adaptations or imports from somewhere else. And so there's this mimetic process in the world, this shuffling of the cards on a gigantic scale. And it means that the detailed customary content of the national identities, the collective identities, is being hollowed out. And therefore, we get this accident. This is what I'm calling the accident. The accident is that two nations come to live side by side, and they hate each other, not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike, and because they want to be different. So. A tangible collective identity that is manifest in defined customs is porous and susceptible to compromise. But the intransigent will to difference is not susceptible to compromise because it's abstract. And that is the distinctive and peculiarly poisonous character of contemporary nationalism. So, in response to it, there are two typical answers. So one answer is the answer of liberal cosmopolitanism, which is suppress difference in favor of convergence. And the other is the answer of regressive nationalism, which says return to the inherited difference. But I think that the correct response of the Democrats 
politics of deep freedom is a quick difference. That is, make the nations of the world capable of creating new difference through political and economic institutions that make them able to invent different futures. Difference is not the problem. Difference on this view is the solution. And so I see that as part of what I, I call the politics of deep freedom. And that's in response to your idea of whether it's a universal vision. No, it's not. So the idea is that we equip the nations of the world to become different. That should be what we want because there's no natural way of being human. Now, by sovereignty, you mean national independence, right? Yes. I'm trying to understand, is it because there are going to be excluded groups within the nation state? Or is it because there's going to be someone outside the nation state? Uh -huh. Now you say it's inevitable. Why is it inevitable? Well, uh, I'm not sure, because national identity used to be based on inherited similarity. Uh, and the alternative way of thinking about it is that what matters, the, the basis of national solidarity is doing things together. So it's future-oriented, not past-oriented. And the question of whether there are groups that have to be excluded is an empirical question. It depends on what these things, doing things together, are. So, uh, of Renan in the 19th century said, what is a nation? A nation is a perpetual plebiscite, a daily plebiscite. You're, you, you're engaged in, com in common tasks. It, the multiplication of forms of collective action is the ultimate and most powerful source of social solidarity, of social cohesion. It's not because you were born in the same groups or you look alike as you, you look like someone else, but because you're drawn into activities of common purpose. That's a higher form of the creation, and it can be more or less successful, but I don't see any reason a priori why you have to see it as condemned to failure. So I guess I disagree with your proposition. 
Yes. Well, I do believe, I, I do believe that the distinct, I, I, I believe that the distinction between right and left has, is not without meaning. That its meaning has to be more than So I think that the distinction that we have has been reduced to these terms that I described as shallow freedom and shallow equality. And against the background of institutional skepticism or uh, conservatism. I don't think that's how the early 19th century liberals and socialists thought of the distinction between right and left. So, and I, I feel much closer to their view than to the view of my, my contemporaries. So how do I see the distinction between right and left? To me, there are two crucial elements. One element is the disposition to take the established institutional framework as the unsurpassable horizon or not of our political projects. That is, is it simply an attempt to humanize or to manage the established institutional order, or does it proceed by some transformation of the established institutions. Now, the problem is that we have no usable conception of structural change, of institutional change, because classical European social theory, especially Marxism, had a conception of structural change which is not usable, not believable. So there's an indivisible system like capitalism. And that generates a binary idea of politics. You either have the reformist management of a system, or you have the revolutionary substitution of one system by another. That binary idea of politics is false. The characteristic form of structural change in history is always fragmentary. But it can nevertheless become revolutionary if it proceeds in a certain direction under the light of a certain idea. So, th so I would say that's one difference between the, the, the conservatives and the progressives. Their attitude to the established structure, the established institutional structure, and the ideological assumptions associated with it. Now, the second crucial difference between the right and the left, to my mind, is how do they answer the question, is it natural for human life to be small? I think the conservatives are the ones who believe it is natural for human life to be small. There's an elite of inventors, of geniuses, of entrepreneurs who are released by their personal talents from the fate of belittlement and then everyone is temporarily released from the fate of belittlement in moments of emergency, especially in war. And the sacrificial devotions of war are then the moment of release from, from belittlement. So, like, remember at the beginning of War and Peace, Pierre looks up at the sky and he sees Halley's Halley's Comet, and it is a presage of, of, of Napoleon's invasion of Russia. And then he realizes that they'll all be drawn out of this rut, of this long littleness of life, and life will become different temporarily. So the conservative thinks that, the, the, that that's how we're released from belittlement, either by extraordinary talent or by national calamity. Uh, the progressive is the one who believes it's not natural for human life to be small. And we can all rise, but we must rise together, or not at all, to a higher level of life with more intensity, with more capability, with more scope. That's what I meant by deep freedom. And so I think that's a profound difference. 
this combination of whether we're fated to belittlement and whether we must accept the institutional structure or not. Now, of course, by that standard, which I've just stated, it's like in real politics, everyone is a conservative because I've defined the distinction between right and left in a way which has made the box of the left empty. <laughs> but that's what I think. So I think the institutionally conservative social democrats who think that all they can do is humanize the market order that their conservative adversaries have created and that all this talk about empowerment, about greatness, is a romantic uh, escape from the reality, uh, they're all on the conservative side of the distinction that I've just traced. So that's how I think of it. Yeah. Well, of course, by calling it an interlude, I'm simply expressing my intrinsically hopeful nature. <laughs> uh, I'm simply suggesting that it won't last very long. <laughs> but that's just a, it's just a hope. Uh, <laughs> so I'll hold out. Huh? Uh, but again, we, d we, we don't get to choose our place in history. So I, I, I think I mentioned before in one of these classes, St. Augustine said, all ages are equidistant from eternity. But it matters what your, what your place in history is, the historical moment. And this is a counter-revolutionary moment. So what I'm saying is they're not going to get my money. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hold out. Huh? Very simple. Could you could you restate the gist of your question? I didn't quite get it. Yes. So it's so I, it seems that the part of the question you're asking is a question about the limitations. So the nation state remains the sovereign state, remains the main space of action in the world, right? It won't be the main space of action forever, but it is now. And uh, so all of these projects take, pl take place under the shield of states. And then the question is, should there be a world government and so forth? I don't think there should be a world government. And I hope for a world that governs itself without world government. Uh, and so then there has to be another formula for how the states could collaborate in the solution of problems that they can't solve themselves or can't solve alone. And there's only one way in which that can happen. So although there's a lot of bad utopian writing about internationalism, it's like writing on a clean slate how the world should be organized, practical experience shows that there's only one way in which uh, we can solve 
we can provide global public good through the voluntary cooperation of states, what you could call coalitions of the willing, huh? based either on region, on similarity of function or importance in the state system, or special purpose organizations that are designed to serve particular problems, like the climate problem. That's the only thing that works. And I, th I believe there's a vast potential in that. But the hardest problem to deal with, of course, under those arrangements that we have in the world, is armed conflict among the great powers. That's the most recalcitrant problem. And that demands special attention. Yes, go on. Why? Because you think that these troublemakers would not would be resistant to working with others? Is that, is that the basic idea? I don't think that's true of the corrected version of the ethic of self-fashioning that we're struggling to formulate. Huh? Uh, it has a politics, this politics of deep freedom. The politics of deep freedom includes the idea of that social cohesion arises from doing things together. It's something that is produced rather than something that's inherited. So I don't see it as incompatible at all with participation in an international order. Uh, but it then, of course, has to be public spirited, and it, it can't be just it can't be just a form of self-aggrandizement. There is a tension. So I think that the, um, so first of all, although I'm describing the, we're, we're, we're beginning to set up the basis for a revised and strengthened form of this ethic. I haven't said what my position is, where <laughs> I, am a defender of the revised version of this ethic or the revised version of the other. Let's, 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 let's keep that open. What I would say is that, uh, as, as I mentioned, one of the remaining characteristics of this ethic, even after we criticize it and revise it, is this idea of the election of disruption the disruptors, I said. They're the spiritual aristocracy of the human race. They're the vanguard, the troublemakers. The defender of the ethic of connection and responsibility suspects that this propaganda of disruption and troublemaking is a euphemism for some kind of self-aggrandizement. And I I think there's, there's some obvious truth in that. So uh, I think we have to be open to that. And uh, the, the, the tension that you describe is, is real. And uh, it's part of this situation. So I agree with you. <laughs>
by Michael, I think, right? Weren't you the original? The, the, the yeah. Oh, there was a question today also yeah. by Carl yeah. Schmidt. You mean among states? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh -huh. So on that account, because even in Gaul, I think there may be a presupposition that different economic development, right? So that experience of Louisiana or under Gaul, what are we to think is that that society truly? Uh -huh. And so he seems to me that I can reasonably see that the experiment of developing countries based on the concept of free freedom would be limited to very few states like Switzerland. Are no longer? Still in peace. Uh huh. And are no longer aspirational as much later than even the Gaulic Church, but to some extent are claimed uh, for us, right? And as some of the colleagues said, free, uh, free freedom is free free cost, right? It's a free free freedom. It's free trying in what terms? Not free free freedom. Right? Well, well, well but, but first of all, I don't see this, these ideas. Uh, the idea of the freedom is a kind of moral luxury that only the rich can enjoy. I think it's, 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 uh, it has an economic dimension of how we, what, what the basis of development is. So right now in the world, one country after another is industrialized, is deindustrialized. Uh, conventional industrialization was the proposal of classical development economics, by which I mean the development economics of the second half of the 20th century. It no longer works. So development economics had the idea, there's a shortcut to economic growth. The shortcut is to take workers and resources from the less productive sector of the economy and put them into the more productive sector, meaning in practice, take them out of agriculture and put them into industry. That shortcut has stopped working for a variety of reasons. That the conventional industry is no longer the vanguard. It's the, it's the vestige of a past vanguard, or it's the satellite to the new vanguard of the knowledge economy. But the new vanguard, where it exists, as in all the major economies of the world, exists only as a series of socially exclusive fringes excluding the vast majority of workers and of businesses. So there's an elite in these fringes. Everyone else is condemned to some kind of make work. Uh, that's the situation. And so we have a dilemma in the world about economic growth. This is an economic question. The dilemma is the old formula of growth, which is conventional industrialization, has stopped working. And the alternative to it, which would be a socially inclusive form of the knowledge economy, a knowledge economy for the many, doesn't exist. It doesn't exist even in the richest countries with the most educated populations. How can it then exist in the rest of the world? 
That's the problem we have to solve. And we can solve it only in one way, on the second side, by transforming the seemingly impossible task into a feasible one, breaking it up into steps and pieces, and seeing how we're going to lift the rear guard and render it, bring it closer to the frontier of productive practice and technology. Now, there's no formula for that. And uh, we can only learn that experimentally. Right? What is a 21st century counterpart to 19th century agricultural extension that could lift up this, 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 this rear guard? And so I want to generalize the, the, the principle in that example. The, the generalization is this. Like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we have come to recognize, or we should recognize, the primacy of structural, meaning institutional alternatives. But unlike them, we have reason not to entrust our future to dogmatic institutional blueprints, as they did. Each sect of the 19th century liberals and socialists had a dogma, say, do this or do that, and you'll be both rich and free. Huh? We have reason not to believe in that. And so we have a problem without historical precedent, which is how to affirm the primacy of structural alternatives without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. And part of the solution to that unprecedented problem is to develop economic and political institutions that are experimentalist and that allow us to find the way along the way to develop it experimentally. And that's, so I don't see that as a, as a moral luxury. I see that as a practical imperative. And then, of course, it, it, it gains an international dimension because one of the possible focal points for international cooperation, cooperation among sovereign states, would be to cooperate in the, in, in the development of the technologies and the institutions that are necessary to the creation of a knowledge economy for the many. Uh, so, that, th th that's what I think. I, I, I don't think it's a luxury. I think it's an imperative. Are we, uh, so, so time up? Yeah. Oh. So I think that is a perfect way to wrap up today. In two weeks, we will turn to the ethics of cooperation, beginning with the early formulation in Confucianism and in its reconstruction thereafter. And after that, of course, we will engage in the debate between the two. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful spring break. Thank you.